British King George III has suffered about 300 years of bad publicity. It starts with the Declaration of Independence, in which Thomas Jefferson describes him as a tyrant who wants to suffocate the American experiment in its cradle. He has refused to assent to laws necessary to the public good. He has abdicated government here. He has dissolved legislative houses repeatedly. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. Later accounts focused on the mental illnesses of King George, where he suffered from anxiety, hallucinations, insomnia, and manic and depressive periods. 20th century films like The Madness of King George show him suffering from the final stages of Porphyria, where he's running around palaces just completely out of his mind. And the 21st century isn't any kinder. The musical Hamilton shows him as preening, spitting, and completely pompous. But in 2017, the Queen of England put 200,000 pages of the Georgian King's private papers online, about half of which related to George III, and these papers have forced a full-scale reinterpretation of the King's life and reign. Today's guest is Andrew Roberts, author of the book The Last King of America. He had unprecedented access to these archives, and what resulted is the first new biography of King George in 50 years. We discuss how he was arguably a wise, humane, and even enlightened monarch who suffered from talented enemies, debilitating mental illnesses, incompetent ministers, and disastrous luck, in which he reigned during some of Britain's hardest times, particularly the Napoleonic Wars. Above all, we see a much more nuanced picture than the villain of the American Revolution. He was arguably a monarch who created the modern notion of royalty, a powerful leader who carries the weight of noblesse oblige, and he's also relatable to his subjects and more of a man of a people than somebody who has the sense of divine right. This is a good re-examination of a well-known but mostly disliked figure. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Andrew Roberts. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed for having me on, Scott. Well, we are going to talk about somebody who has appeared on this podcast before and discussions about the nature of his mental illness as well, because there are centuries of speculation. And you have written perhaps the most extensively researched and sourced book on uh, King George III in a while. And he's an interesting person to study because I think he has the bad misfortune, at least in the United States, of being eternally villainized because he is the villain in an immortal document, the American Declaration of Independence. So much in the way that there's probably not much that Judas Iscariot or Brutus could ever do to reclaim their reputation because they're villainized in biblical texts, in Roman accounts, in Dante's Divine Comedy. So George might suffer a similar fate, at least on this side of the Atlantic. But to enter into his life, what made you want to research him and do a biography of him? Well, firstly, I'd like to take you up on the thing you just said. You're absolutely wrong. Once people have read my book, they're going to realize immediately that uh, <laughs> uh, unlike Judas Iscariot or any of those other people you mentioned, that we can, with evidence, overthrow a theory that's been around for 200 years and in complete control of the historiography for two centuries. So I'm not letting you put me off. Um, the story <laughs> is um, with regard to, with regard to his, his illness, that we are in a position now, thank God, finally, to, uh, in a world which has destigmatized mental illness, to actually recognize that his illness, which was uh, bipolar disorder, type one, effective type one, was not his fault. You know, he shouldn't be seen as a, a sort of morally guilty for having had this disease in the same way that Whig historians for the last two centuries or so have actually blamed him for it. I think we can get beyond that, can't we? I think so. And we'll get into uh, the different theories because uh, there is, at least from what I've read of his life, imputation of the standpoint of historians of uh, theories that would explain it. And Knox on Porphyria, maybe it's a way to indict the light inbreeding of the entire uh, European monarchical class. And then arsenic poisoning, maybe talking about bumbling doctors, but uh, we could save that for a bit. So let's first start off with the maybe an exploration of George's life, and then we can talk about his uh, afterlife and how people have understood him and how you think he should be reexamined. So first, George himself, for especially American listeners who don't know about different houses and the House of Hanover and whatnot, what is his lineage? And when he's born, what are the state of affairs of the British Empire? Well, he's, he's born in 1738, and the British Empire is what's known as the First Empire, in that it has got America, but by that stage hasn't really got much of a purchase on India or other parts of uh, Africa. 
his father died when he was when George was 12 years old and so he became the heir to the throne to his grandfather George II who hated him and uh, and he hated uh, the whole of the Hanoverians frankly hated each other for generations it's an extremely dysfunctional family apart from his own father who loved him and he and he loved his father so you have this series of monarchs who all hate their children and their and their parents except for George III and I've also read dis- different accounts of him as a child where some biographers say that he was feeble-minded and had he not born, been born into those royal circumstances, he would be a manual laborer. One of them is J.H. Plum. But then others say, no, he wouldn't be a, a Marcus Aurelius, but he is well-rounded and educated and he deserves more credit than that. What's your take? He can read and write Latin by the age of 11. He had spoke four languages. He wrote brilliant essays once he was being tutored properly. The idea that he was some sort of, you know, subnormal when it came to intelligence is complete rubbish. And it's a continuation of the Whig view of history, which I'm afraid Jack Plum, even though he taught my teachers at uh, Cambridge, was appalling in this regard. There's one point where he also says that one of the things that drove George III mad was that he had to make love to his hideous wife, I mean, this is the kind of um, language that we are thinking that we should have grown out of long before he was even saying it in the 1950s, and certainly by now. So I think we can quite frankly put Jack Plum and his theories of George III to one side and get on with some you know, modern analysis instead. Right. I mean, if nothing else, I mean, you can't really argue they had an unhappy marriage or, well, I, I suppose you could get into that more, but they had 15 children. Yes, that's right. If he was, if he, if he did have to make, love, <laughs> if he did have to make love to his hideous, the ugly wife, he certainly chose to do it on a large number of occasions. In fact, <laughs> it was an incredibly happy marriage. They, which is a chance in a million, really, because they didn't meet until six hours before the wedding, and that's the first time they met. But it turned into a proper love match. They had lots in common. They had a happy marriage for uh, forty years until. His mental illness meant that they couldn't share a bed or a room any longer, and and that's what broke it up. It's a it's a, a love story, but also a tragic one, right? And which, from what I, by all reasonable accounts, he was one of the few monarchs that didn't have a mistress, which probably puts you in the top five percent of morality among European monarchs in the 18th century. He was the only one. He was the only one of the. Oh, sorry, he was the only one in the of the Hanoverians of the entire House of Hanover not to have a mistress, uh, but somebody who was in love with his wife all his life and usurious uh, to her. And what was his uh, court like? I think some of his children mentioned that it was one of the dullest courts in Europe. Yes, it wasn't very exciting. There were lots of rules and regulations. There were, I mean, it was nothing like Versailles, for example. There was not, not all that dressing up and, and, you know, pomp and circumstance. But yes, you weren't allowed to sort of cough or sneeze near the king. There were the day was very much sort of planned out. They, they tended to eat very frugally and boringly. They were prudent financially. They weren't anything like as much fun as the, as the monarchies of, the, of Europe. But let's remember, of course, that their throne survived, whereas the Bourbons at the Versailles uh, didn't. And so actually probably being closer to the people, he was nicknamed Farmer George at a time when 80% of uh, Britons took their, their livelihoods from agriculture. Being a sort of more normal, almost middle class monarch was something that that ultimately worked extremely well for them. Yeah, that's interesting. And before uh, getting into the as his he really enters into the main points of his reign, and uh, at least with his domestic life, there's some a fair amount of rebellion among his children. Where uh, his son George the Fourth he weds a Catholic widow in an illegal ceremony. The girls are largely secluded from the outside world and eligible marriage partners. I think one of his sons fathered 10 illegitimate children with his mistress. So what was his domestic situation like? Is it, are they pushing back against this secluded royal court or is it that's just state of affairs at that time? Well, no, unfortunately, it's a, it's a systematic thing. It's sort of institutionalized because they couldn't marry anyone who wasn't royal and wasn't Protestant. The reason that the Hanoverians were on the throne is because they were Protestant. And the trouble is that the only um, Protestant royals were German ones and uh, Scandinavian ones, and not many of those. But when George III himself was looking around for a wife, 
eventually, fortunately, finding Charlotte of Mecklenburg Strelitz. But there were only eight possible ones, of which seven, for one reason or another, had to be struck off. So she was literally the last choice. And it was, it was pure luck that it turned out to be such a successful marriage. With the children, you mentioned Prinny, George the Fourth, as he finally became the Prince Regent. Terrible man. Uh, I couldn't, in the, in the three years or so that I was uh, writing and researching this book, I couldn't find any redeeming features about this human being whatsoever, apart from perhaps his aesthetic taste. He had a good taste in, arch- in architecture and, and art. Other than that, he was just an atrocious human being. And in fact, when he died, the Times pointed out that there will be no man who sheds a tear at the passing of this monarch. And it's true. He, he had... He had compulsive buying disorder, which meant that he was spending so much money, never asking the price of anything, so much money on everything. Clothes, he was a bit like the Imelda Marcos of the late 18th century. He would buy clothes, he'd buy incredibly expensive carriages and horses and so on, and paintings and uh, silver and furniture. To the point that at one point his debts were equal to the amount that Britain was spending on the Royal Navy. And poor old George III, who was hugely prudent uh, financially, hated all this. And he had to cough up to, to buy his son's love letters from mistresses that wound up costing a fortune. He, uh, his son then started to become a, a radical Whig um, oppositionist political figure. And that also caused a lot of trouble in the family. So all in all, he was very unfortunate when it came to his eldest son. But he was very close and loving father to to all the rest of them. Right. He seems to operate out of an abundance of caution. I think the Royal Marriages Act that he pushes sometime in the 1770s, it says that someone who's going to marry into the royal family has to be approved by the sovereign. So that's a, a way to look at it, that he's trying to protect them of abundance of caution. He was trying to protect his children. With the 1772 Royal Marriages Act, he was trying to protect his children, or at least he was trying to protect himself from um, his children making a, an unfortunate marriage in the same way that so many of his brothers and, and uncles did. But it didn't really work because it just meant that the, the royal dukes had the right to, essentially, to, to go off and take mistresses because they weren't being given permission to marry um, uh, Protestant princesses. So let's look at uh, points of his life that you think pushes against the lingering effects of the Whig narrative about him, and or at least in the United States, the radioactive half-life of the impression of him that has to do with the Declaration of Independence and other nationalist narratives, and even up to today, Hamilton, that castigates him as a villain. One point you make is that in the, let's start with the 1750s, where you note that he is writing as a young man against the institution of slavery. So what is this? And do you see this ideology affecting his reign later on? Yes, this is very interesting. This is in one of the papers that uh, the essays that he was writing for the Earl of Butte, who he installed as prime minister soon after coming to the throne. And he's writing it in the 1750s, as you say, when he's the uh, Prince of Wales. And it's a commentary on Montesquieu's essays on the laws. And he basically looks at all of the arguments in favour of, of slavery and, and denounces them and says, and I've got the quote here, it's only a sentence, what shall we say for a European traffic in black slaves? The very reasons urged for it will be perhaps sufficient to make us hold such practice in execration for an inhuman custom wantonly practised by the most enlightened polite nations in the world. There is no occasion to answer them, for they stand self-condemned. And George III never bought or sold a slave in his life. He never invested in any of the companies that did that. He never he signed the, the uh, legislation, of course, in 1807, which abolished the slave trade. And yet he's constantly seen in a sort of less, less positive moral light than the founding fathers. 41 of the 56 signatories of the Declaration of Independence did own slaves at some stage in their lives. So I think it is interesting, this this sort of dichotomy between them. Well, let's get to the heart of the matter about the Declaration of Independence charges that Thomas Jefferson make against him, because I've spoken with a number of legal scholars on this podcast. Many of them speak with admiration of the Declaration of Independence, also the U.S. Constitution, because of their staying power. And the Declaration of Independence is a foundation of Jeffersonian natural law, where it's laying down the framework of what is a moral and just government, which uh, operates under the consent of the government. 
And George is depicted as a photo negative. He is the antithesis of what a good government supported by natural law should be. So, but you note that he's in fact not guilty of most of the charges that Jefferson makes. So how are these charges not true? And why do you think they're making them against George? Is he simply useful vessel to throw these charges against? Well, I think it's the um, good questions. I think it's the classic wartime propaganda document, but written in the most sublime Shakespearean language. I mean, that prose at the beginning in the first third is makes you proud to be human. But in the second two thirds of it, he comes up with 28 charges, of which only two is George guilty. However, those two about taxation and about um, that's the 17th charge, which is about taxation, the 22nd one is about Parliament having veto rights over American laws. Those in and of themselves justify the American Revolution. And But the 26 ones earlier, well, I mean, some of them are ex post facto rationalizations, of course, that come later because um, of things that had happened once the war had broken out for independence. Others were things that had been going on since the days of Elizabeth I and uh, Oliver Cromwell and can't really be blamed on George III owing to the fact that he didn't institute them. Others were um, things that he didn't do at all. I mean, for example, the one about transporting people over the oceans for trial, not a single person, you know, ever was transported over the oceans without trial. So there was an element of padding of the brief. Some of the charges overlapped with lots of others. Some of them were general charges, and yet they only referred to one thing that had particularly been done, a specific thing, which Jefferson then turned into a general kind of overall and overarching criticism. And so poor old George III, in this very um, personal ad hominem attack, winds up in this, as you say, this uh, this piece of uh, writing which becomes holy writ, essentially, for uh, America. And the reason that they, he had to do it was that they needed to, they very much saw themselves as the inheritors of the mantle of the earlier revolutions, the 1642 revolution against Charles I and the 1688 glorious revolution against James II. And therefore, they needed to try to make George III into a sort of absolutist Stuart monarch who believed in the divine right of kings, even though he was actually a constitutional Hanoverian monarch who only had his throne because he didn't believe in the divine right of kings. This is an interesting thing that is uh, changing significantly in the 18th century. And for a companion episode, listeners can listen to one on the royal touch and how subjects understanding of what this can do changes over time. Another companion episode, I promise I give George a very good hearing on this, but I did a series called History's Most Insane Rulers. And here I'm using the legal definition of insanity. And he's one of the more well-known who fits into this category. But I dive into the different theories about him. And uh, this is so if listeners want to hear the kind of the general overview here, we can, you know, do the much deeper analysis. So getting into uh, his first bout with what was in the 20th century credited with porphyria, uh, blood disease in the 1760s, and there are other episodes that come across later. What were his first struggles with mental illness? And can you talk about theories over the, the centuries about what this was as it was happening? Well, very interestingly, um, I mean, I think you're right when you say the first bout was in the 1760s. It was, I think, a prodrome attack of, um, of bipolar in 1765. They, but the drawback is that we don't have any of the symptoms owing to the fact that it was essentially uh, covered up by the royal family. They called it a bad cold even though it lasted four months, and they didn't accept that it was anything more serious than that. So although the prime minister wasn't allowed to see him on several occasions, and he was kept out of public view, and we later hear from one of the courtiers that he, he had a mental illness as opposed to just a bad you know, throat, we don't have that much more about it. However, prodrome attacks are quite common in bipolar and can then go away for a very long time, which is what happened in George III's case, because the next certain and the first certain attack takes place in uh, 1788. And of course, that's five years after the end of the American War of Independence, once America has become independent. So there was no uh, sense that the American War of Independence was in any way affected by 
so-called Mad King George. Then after that, he has further attacks in 1801, 1804. And then finally, the day after his, his Golden Jubilee in 1810, he goes completely mad. And unfortunately, by then, he's also blind and soon afterwards goes uh, deaf and senile. So the last 10 years of his life is spent in a great deal of, of sort of pathos, really, at Windsor Castle. But the symptoms, the early ones, I'm afraid quite a lot of this is to do with the colour of the faeces and urine of the king, which misleading symptoms were given by this couple in the 90s, sorry, not couple, uh, mother and son in the 1960s to doctors. And they, being given the misleading symptoms, did come up with porphyria. But now all the modern, the last 10 years of learned articles in medical papers about this have all tended towards the uh, manic depression theory. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. There was another one in 2003, I believe, that there was an analysis of George III's hair. A British museum worker discovered an envelope that had a lock of it, and they claimed with testing that it could have he could have died due to arsenic poisoning, whether by physicians at the time prescribing him something that would eventually kill him, or it could be powder in his wig. What do you make of this theory? I don't go along with this theory because it's so, there's virtually nobody in the 18th century who didn't have high arsenic uh, levels in their, um, in their hair. Uh, Napoleon obviously is supposed to have been um, poisoned by the arsenic in his wallpaper. Um, I, I looked into that when I was writing biography of Napoleon as well, and it just simply didn't uh, stack up. It's obviously tremendously difficult 200 years afterwards to ascribe medical conditions to uh, to anyone that who's been dead that long. But there are large numbers of people who are who have arsenic in their hair, and uh, I think they just used arsenic an awful lot more when they didn't know quite how dangerous it was um, for all sorts of things. I think you can also build up a certain degree of immunity to arsenic. But if he was being poisoned by arsenic, I can't see, first of all, why it would take him 10 years to die. And secondly, why no, none of the other things that you see in arsenic poisoning are present in, uh, in the kit. Um, no, I think it's perfectly reasonable that uh, the thing that people like Sir Simon Wesley, the uh, president of the Royal College of Medicine, who's also the only president also to have been president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, point out, and also the porphyria doctors who say that it isn't porphyria. I think uh, it's not difficult when you see somebody who babbles for 24 hours, talking nonstop, who suddenly throws himself on the ground and leaps up again, again and again, who talks sort of manically and does many of the things that are not seen in arsenic poisoning, but are seen in, in bipolar disorder, to accept um, this new um, diagnosis. And if you read the, uh, it's relatively short, I think four or five pages of the appendix of my book, I do think that you'll be you'll be convinced. And before getting into why these theories that maybe aren't well sourced have had so much staying power, what are some of the better known events when he was in a full manic state where we were talking before this interview that there's a theory that I couldn't source anywhere that he planted stakes and thought it would grow a tree and um, sprout out stakes. It was on some article, of, but I couldn't source that to anything. So that sounds speculation. But are there things that are better sourced of what he did do in his more manic states? Well, there, there are from, from some of the doctor's reports. But the trouble is that also you have an enormous, uh, once he had uh, gone mad, it became part of a sort of cottage industry in the publishing world to bring out books about his madness. And so uh, people who claim to be a page of the court would publish a book in saying that he had greeted a tree and called him Frederick the Great and had had a, a long and friendly conversation with him. One of the things I think that makes that unlikely is that he couldn't stand Frederick the Great, uh, never met him, disliked him, and tried to get out of alliances with him. So the idea of him greeting him as a friend, even if he uh, was a tree, makes it unlikely to be true in my view. But no, there are lots of other things. You know, he was tortured to a, uh, to a great degree, poor man. They cupped him which was um, a repulsive thing where you put a, a cup on, on his thigh and then heat it up and create blisters unnecessarily. You got 
him uh, being uh, straightjacketed for 24 hours in a row. He was attached to a chair that was nailed to the floor for long periods. Uh, he was bled. You know, none of these things do any good to somebody suffering from bipolar disorder. And in fact, they're only likely to make the whole situation worse. You know, and I'm usually fascinated by uh, if there are historical theories that are later debunked. I'm always curious why certain theories have so much staying power. And maybe it's because they flatter an audience's sensibilities or preconceptions. So, for example, let's take the case of porphyria, the blood disease. In the film that came out in 1994, The Madness of King George, porphyria is credited for his madness. There was a wonderful television series called Turn about George Washington's spy network. And there are, a, it came out a few years ago, and there are a few scenes with George, and he seems fully schizophrenic. He's hearing voices, he's angry, he's raving. So, what do you think is the Porphyria thesis or others like this? Is it latent effects of the Whig theory, or why do you think it ha- this theory had so much purchase for so long? Um, I'll come on to that. But of course, just to remind you, you know, he did not have anything go wrong with him mentally whilst the American War of Independence was going on. So, right. So, as much as I enjoyed Turn, it, uh, it, it <laughs> historically was wildly it took out. liberties there. I mean, almost Bridgerton level kind of uh, liberties. But no, I think with regard to the Heitner, Nicholas Heitner play, and the, which was based on the Alan Bennett, sorry, the Nicholas Heitner movie based on the Alan Bennett play, they very much took this from the book that this mother and son duo came up with in the late 1960s, which I've debunked. And it's very difficult not to actually see that the way in which this pair handed out evidence that was so skewed towards the Porphyria uh, thesis and didn't come up with any other uh, explanations for why his feces and urine might be a different colour, might might have been this porphyry colour, including the fact that he was eating beetroot um, at the same time and was taking aloes and gentium and various other medicines that had this effect too. And so they, they sort of got into a, into a mindset where they only gave the doctors evidence that backed up their own thesis. Um, why, to take um, the The larger question you asked right at the beginning, why people tend to go for various theses, I think very often they went for the most colourful ones. I mean, you mentioned the one about stakes being put into the ground. I don't for a moment doubt that someone somewhere has has brought forward that theory, Uh, just like they brought forward the one about talking to the tree who was Frederick the Great. You know, people do like to have the more... um, uh, interesting, fun, unusual, and and sort of gossipy, frankly, answer. But the good thing is that now we have got a, a proper body of evidence, as I say, in my um, appendix to this book, that uh, I think really does uh, nail down what, what genuinely he suffered from. Well, we could step aside the theories of his madness because uh, you've written about his the rest of his life and his accomplishments, and I would like to discuss that. Something that struck me when I was reading about his conditions is that he was deeply beloved by his subjects. Many hoped throughout his reign, even up to the very end in his 80s, that he would be able to enjoy a full recovery because he had recovered in the past. So, I mean, it really seems surprising, I mean, how much he was adored by his subjects. So is that common for monarchs or was there something that he did to establish a relationship between him and the people of Britain? Yes, when he came to the throne, he he was the first one for a very long time to be born and bred in uh, in Britain. He he didn't speak German as, as his first language. In fact, he didn't speak it with a speak English with a German accent, which was the first um, of his of the Hanovers to do that. And he told Parliament, "Born and bred in this country, I glory in the name of Britain," and that gave him a, an immediate sort of boost of popularity because they realised they hadn't got a foreigner as, as king for the first time in uh, centuries. And then, of course, he had this Farmer George label that was put on him by intellectuals in a rather sort of sneering way, but it actually was picked up by the ordinary people, 80% of whom uh, took their livelihoods from agriculture. And so um, they liked the fact he was a farmer. He, he would dress normally as an English country gentleman. He would go around without entourage and and bodyguards, he would go out and 
talk to farmers about prices of, uh, of produce and so on. He himself was a farmer. He had uh, he wrote uh, articles for farming uh, farming magazines about crop rotation and manure and things like that, which um, no king had ever done before. And by the time he had been on the throne for fifty years, um, people loved him. And it was his uh, his golden jubilee that uh, was was celebrated up and down the uh, the, the land in a, in a major way, huge celebrations. And unfortunately, his last and uh, final and worst bout of madness came the day after them. And it's interesting that intellectuals sneered at him because he loved classical music. He played the harpsichord, and. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't he also a patron of Handel? And we, in a way, owe George credit for Handel's music being as available as it is today. Um, more, more. Um, his grandfather actually was was more of um, oh, okay, the Mandel man. But um, having said that, he did also love Handel and uh, Haydn as well. He tried to make sure stayed in uh, Britain. Uh, he hired Mozart to come to play at uh, Buckingham Palace. But when one thinks of his, uh, it's, it's far beyond music, I and mean, he played four instruments himself. But also, he, the planet Uranus was named after him because he was so interested in astronomy and helped finance the largest telescope in the world. Um, he was a great supporter of uh, Georgian neoclassical architecture. He had the largest collection of scientific instruments in the world that he built up. The British Library today, its nucleus, the centre of it, is the 80,000 books that he built up as his private library, and he established the uh, Royal Academy. He invented it. So, you know, we, we have this man who is immensely cultured, in fact, and yet who Tom Paine called the Royal Brute of Britain in his pamphlet, Common Sense. And that's unfortunately how uh, all too many people still think of him. And, uh, and, and they're wrong too. You know, the, the Royal Collection today, which is the largest collection of art in the private hands in the world, Half of those paintings were, were bought by George III. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. I'd like to hear about what you describe as his legacy on the institution of the monarchy. But before that, I'm curious if you've ever placed him in the rankings of uh, British kings or queens. In the United States, historians love to rank presidents. C-SPAN every four years, I believe, uh, releases a new ranking on presidents uh, based on 10 different criteria from Abraham Lincoln at the top to Warren G. Harding or James Buchanan at the very bottom. So I'm curious, where would you place him? There's a podcast called The Rex Factor that does this exact thing. So where is George III? By the way, we, we do that for prime ministers the whole time. You know, the, the arguments okay. about whether, <laughs> whether Lloyd George or, or Winston Churchill or Margaret Thatcher, you know, he should be at the top. Uh, it's, a, it's a big thing. And actually, funny enough you should, that you should mention this, you know, he was very unfortunate because in the 14 prime ministers who he appointed, only two of them were remarkable statesmen, William Pitt the Younger and William Pitt the Elder. So he was unfortunate, really, in that sense. And that's why he can't be... In the in the sort of top ten of kings and queens of England for their for their sort of splendor and glory and success, you know, ultimately he was the king who was was on the throne when the greatest strategic disaster befell Britain between the loss of the Angevin lands in the 15th century and the fall of France in 1940, essentially. Um, but what he wasn't was a tyrant. You know, he was not this this sort of evil despotic figure. He wasn't this ridiculous joke figure of Hamilton the Musical or Bridgerton. He was somebody who was 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 intelligent and hardworking and good natured. And, it, and of the two wars that he did win, or at least he was king of, where, when victory was won, at the Seven Years' War and the Napoleonic Wars, those are two tremendously important conflicts and, and long conflicts in British history. You mentioned the modern monarchy, and I think that really would be the legacy. I think he's more important than Queen Victoria when it comes to what the modern monarchy looks like today. I think that when one looks at he, the fact that he was the person who built, uh, who sorry, who bought Buckingham Palace, the um, the gold state coach, which is still used for coronations and so on, he instituted the annual trooping of the colour, the royal walkabout at uh, Windsor. Royal Ascot is uh, his invention, the royal enclosure there at least. 
He was buried at Windsor, the first king since Charles I to be. And then ever since him, all of the, all of the monarchs have been buried there. And it, mo- most importantly, when you look at Her Majesty the Queen today and see her commitment to duty and hard work and financial prudence and, and frugality, that, all of that comes from, um, from George III, two generations before his granddaughter, Queen Victoria. What do you think uh, explains this change? Is it his temperament where he's a more man of the people? Are these larger scale structural changes that are happening to European monarchs in the 18th century where the idea of divine right is shifting and preceding the revolutions of the 19th century, the monarchies are changing in kind for these you know, early tremors that are coming along. So why do you think he brought about this change? I think he spotted the yes, he spotted the way in which the the world was working. He recognised that people wanted to have a sort of almost bourgeois monarchy, uh, where people were faithful to their wives, and you know people did have the domestic virtues, middle class virtues, and that that ultimately was going to be the thing that was going to save the monarchy, and that the sort of wild extravagance of the of the Bourbon court at uh, Versailles would simply not do for a parliamentary and constitutional democracy like uh, Britain was becoming. So I think he saw into the future. He very much, of course, that did fit in with his own personality and his own exoriousness and so on. But in that sense, I think he, he set down some markers that we can see to this day strengthen the House of Windsor. So if you were a monarch today in the 21st century, in the age of Some still keep their composure. Some have descended directly and openly embrace the tabloid world. How do you think George would fare if he were a monarch? I think he'd fare pretty well. Um, Her Majesty the Queen has never given an interview in her life any more than George the uh, Third did. When royals do give interviews, they tend to be disastrous um, for them. And so I think that uh, the way in which uh, Badgett's uh, line about not letting in daylight upon magic, you know, and trying to keep a mystique of royalty is something that the best of the monarchs understand. And some of the other members of the royal family, especially today, unfortunately, simply don't. And as a result, the uh, familiarity that we uh, have with them has uh, tended to um, breed contempt. So we're very fortunate, really, I think, in in having a monarch who very clearly does, except for the mental illness side of things, obviously, descend from George III. And then also, if you were able to meet George during his reign, is there a question or any particular questions that you would like to ask him? Well, the first and obvious one, I suppose, was, was there any way in which the American um, disaster could have been avoided? You know, what if you'd gone to, why didn't you visit uh, Scotland or Ireland or even Hanover? He was elector of Hanover and never went there. Why did you never go down a coal mine, uh, even though you were the king during the Industrial Revolution? You only visited one factory in your whole life. You never went west of Plymouth or north of Worcester. You know, why did a man of such extraordinary intellectual curiosity as you, who wanted to map the planets, never bother to visit any of your uh, of your realm, um, apart from sort of London and the home counties? And that, and the only times when he went further than that was when he went on holiday down to Devon and and, and Dorset. It really was um, a very strange thing. I'd love to sort of plumb the depths of why he felt that buying 40,000 maps was enough to allow him to to feel, you know, that that he understood his empire. And I would ask him, you know, if you had gone to America and personally met all these uh, people and got a sense of this extraordinary country and the capacity of the country. And if you had known that in 100 years time, it would be the most powerful nation in the world, wouldn't you have just packed up? Why didn't you just pack up your bags and, and move to New York? Because his own, his own family had only been on the throne of Britain for 50 years. You know, uh, they could have treated us in the same way as they t- treated Hanover and moved to America because that would have been a much more sensible place for them. There we are. Those are a few fun uh, questions to ask the king. I'm not sure how he'd have answered them. And um, but luckily, he was quite open to, to sort of open-ended chatting of that nature. He, wasn't, he wouldn't get on his high horse about it. <laughs> 
You made a very interesting point about moving to New York. I'm sure you're giving some audience members who've ever contemplated writing an alternate history book some ideas. This is like a Constantine moving the capital and inaugurating Constantinople of the Roman Empire. That would have that would be very interesting. Well, I think George III is someone who does deserve reexamination, and you have done this in incredible detail. So I recommend listeners who want to get more into the story to look at Andrew's new book, which is called The Last King of America. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it, Scott. All right, that is all for today's episode. If you'd like to see show notes for this and all my other episodes and include sources, maps, or other relevant information, go to ParthenonPodcast.com. Parthenon is the name of the podcast network that History Unplugged is a part of, along with other great history shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other shows as well. If you'd like to support History Unplugged, there are two easy ways to do so. The first is to subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. This really helps the show grow. The second thing is to join our membership program on Patreon. And if you do so, you can get completely ad-free episodes of the entire back catalog of the show, which is 600 episodes and growing. Just go to patreon.com slash unplugged. 